It is so good to be here on a Thursday night. Dude, it felt weird being home on a Thursday night knowing that we should be having church and we weren't having it. And so it was just kind of wild on my part, just kind of going like, this is, there's something missing here. And uh, again, man, it was just kind of interesting to say the least. It has been 12 weeks since we had our last Thursday night study. And it's, it, I was going through my calendar and it's going, this is weird. This is just weird. So again, I know not everybody knows that we actually started up, but hey, the people that are here, God bless you guys. I'm just so stoked to be able to, to be here. And so we're starting a new book tonight. If you are here with us when we're going through the book of Daniel three months ago, um, um, again, we're uh, just turn the page and you'll be in Hosea. If you're not familiar with Hosea, go to Ezekiel and then go one book, you'll get into Daniel, go, go to the next book and then you'll get into Hosea there and that's where we'll start off. And so when we finished, it's interesting because we're going to kind of go back in time because when we finished the book of Daniel, it took us to the time period of about the 6th century, about 536 B.C. And so now we're going to go back in time, um, and, and the book of Hosea takes us back to the 8th century. So we're going from the 6th century to the 8th century. We're going from the 500s over to the 700s. And so the book of Hosea, or his ministry, takes takes place from about 755 to, to about 715. And so he, he has quite a, quite a span of ministry that he does there. And so he kind of basically covered his prophetic ministry, covered about 40 years. So he was in ministry for about 40 years that he was doing all these things. It's, it's an interesting life. If you've never read the book of Hosea, I want to encourage you to read ahead. But it's just an interesting, and, and again, when we start off this chapter, you're going to go, what? Why would God allow that to happen? Or why would he be saying certain things to him to go do? And so the theme of the book, though, of the book of Hosea is... Um, redeeming love and and it's not going to sound like the 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 theme fits when we're reading kind of through it because you're going to go really redeeming love when when it seems like there's judgment because it almost sounds like this is more of a book of judgment well for there to be a redemption <laughs> there has to be something that's gone wrong in one place and so because of where they're at as a people, because of what's gone on, judgment has been called upon to come to the northern kingdom especially. And so Hosea's prophecy contains some calls for repentance or to repent from their sins. And he did it not in a positive way way but but again because he's calling them he's saying judgment is coming so so you're going to not escape it but there's still time to repent and i don't know if you've ever been in the situation where um god's kind of chastening you disciplining you um and he's calling you to repent but he's going to allow the consequences to happen and it doesn't mean that he hates you, and it doesn't mean that he's left you. It's just that sometimes there's certain sins in our lives that allow us the opportunity, if we would have repented early on, we wouldn't have to go with the consequences. But there's times that God says, hey, I love you, I love you dearly, and there's time to repent. And if you repent, you won't have to you know, go through all the consequences. But there's other times he says, hey, um, I'm giving you time to repent, but you're still going to suffer the consequences. And that kind of kind of hurts. And that's where these people are at. At this point in their life of the nation of Israel as a whole, judgment is inescapable. And the impl implement, implementing and, and applying of the curses because of their sin will now come upon them. And the Lord will cause the nation to experience 
infertility even in their nation, military invasion, and even exile. And so again, it's kind of a sad book, but again, in, in, in through it all, and I hope I can convey it, there is a redemption love. There is a redemptive love that's associated with this. And I think that whenever, because we've been in the Old Testament on Thursday nights for quite a few, a couple of a few years now, it seems like, you could always see the mercy of God in the Old Testament, and you could always see His grace. And I know oftentimes people go, ah, I, I just don't see it. It's like, it's there. The fact that, <laughs> that Israel is a nation today speaks of the mercies of God. The fact that we are still here today <laughs> speaks about the mercies of God, even from the Old Testament, because He could have wiped out civilization um, and, and then just been done with it. But anyway, so several times Hosea emphasizes the justice of God by indicting, the, uh, indicating the, that the divine punishment is, is coming and, it, and it, it pays the price. It, it fits the crime, if you will. So the Lord will not abandon Israel totally despite the severity of the punishments. Each punishment that came upon them was intended to turn them around. And I think you understand that oftentimes when, when the Lord is bringing conviction upon our hearts that He wants us to turn around from where, where we're at. And, and He gives us time to repent. And, and again, sometimes he'll, he'll woo us back. Sometimes he'll just put the hook and bring us back. Sometimes he'll bring the rod and bring us back. But God is always a redeeming love. And so Hosea chapter 1, we'll, we'll, we'll just read verse 1 first and then we'll move on. It says, The word of the Lord came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Zechariah, kings of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And so what we need to notice first of all here, as we get into the book of Hosea, that it is the word of the Lord that is coming to Hosea, and it is not the word of man. It's not, and, and sometimes you go, well, that's so obvious. It's like, no, sometimes we just read through it, and we forget that God is actually speaking to this man. Because of what we're going to read, because of what we're going to cover, we tend to, to think, well, he's just going and doing what he, he wanted to go do, and it's not the case. It's the word of the Lord came to Hosea, and he spoke to Hosea. He told them what I need you to do, Hosea, and go do it. And now Hosea has the opportunity of being obedient or not obedient to the word of the Lord. And so the, the name Hosea means the Lord saves or the Lord salvation. And it comes from the same Hebrew Greek uh, or the same Hebrew word or root, Hoshua or Hoshua. And that is where we get the name Joshua and Jesus from. And so Hoshua is also the name of the last king of Israel. When I say the king of Israel here, we're speaking about the northern kingdom. And what we're going to see here is that, you know, we're going to touch on the northern king kingdom, the southern kingdom. Israel being the northern kingdom where the ten tribes were, Judah being the southern kingdom where there was two of the tribes. And so Joshua or Josh, Joshua, or however you spell it or say it, um, again, he, he was the last king of Israel, the northern kingdom. The, now, he doesn't have any relation to, to any of the kings. His family comes from the, from, he's from the son of Beri, and we have no other recollection, no other history about who these guys are, except that he is ministering to the northern kingdom for the most part. It's interesting because it says in those days or in those days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Zechariah, kings of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the king of 
or the son of Joash, king of Israel. As I shared earlier, Hosea's ministry extends for about four decades, right? And in the second half of the eighth century, from about 550 or 755 to, to 715, is when he was ministering. And what is interesting here is that he gives us four different kings from the, from the southern kingdom. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Zechariah. Again, these guys were not his kings per se because he's from the northern kingdom, but he lets us know about four kings during his ministry of time. And, and yet, again, he was primarily from the north. And yet he only mentions one king from the north, which is Jeroboam, and he would be Jeroboam the second. Six kings in the northern kingdom from Jeroboam to the end have, have, have gone through his ministry, but he never mentions them, which is, I, I think it's kind of interesting because he just talks about Jeroboam, but he doesn't talk about the other ones, the ones that came after him till the time that they were taken captive. And so he focuses on the, the northern kingdom kings during the, his, his, his time. And so during the time of Jeroboam II, there was four kings that reigned. And so again, you, you see all of this kind of going on. You're going, okay, for some reason, he's not focusing on the kings from the northern kingdom, just the one from the southern kingdom. And it, one of the commentaries said it's quite possible that he omits all these other kings from the northern kingdom because he's kind of focusing on the dynasty of David and that lineage of David because it is from the lineage of David and his dynasty that we eventually get the promise of redemption that is made to the nation of Israel as a whole. So that's one of the possibilities. And so Hosea began his ministry in the days of Jeroboam towards the end of Jeroboam's reign. Now, from a political and economical standpoint, Jeroboam II was a very, very successful and good king when it came to political and economics. Israel prospered, the northern kingdom prospered politically and material, materially under his reign. But it was a time of depravity. <laughs> it, it was a time of spiritual and moral decay. And it's interesting because when nations are doing good, in, in one sense, when, when we're talking about politically and materially, oftentimes the spiritual part of, of a nation begins to wane. Because all of a sudden everything is at their disposal. Why do they really need God when they have everything going for them? And it's interesting because when we start looking at our, our country throughout the years, again, there's times when, when we have people in power and, and it just seems like everything's going bad and people are just like crying out to God. And then other times when we're having prosperity and people are just like decadent and they're just going for it and they cannot get enough. Until something crazy happens. <laughs> and I was, as I was thinking about kind of what we're going through, and we can get upset, right? And, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, everything's falling apart. Can you imagine these prophets? Can you imagine when we're going through the book of Kings, first and second Kings, mostly second Kings, when we're looking at all these kings, king after king after king, especially in the northern kingdom, just about every stinking one of them, it said, and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they went after other gods. And they worshipped other gods. And they did this. And they followed that. And they did all these things. So you, can you imagine the prophets that had to bring the judgment, the word of the Lord to the people because they went after other gods. And so again, as we can be righteously angry and sometimes carnally angry uh, at what, what's going on, 
This is not the first kingdom, the first nation that has ever suffered stuff like this. The people of God have had to go through times like this. And so when we look at a guy like Hosea, and, and he, he mentions all these kings from the, from the southern kingdom, all, all his kings were evil. They always did bad or evil in the sight of the Lord. And so when they were doing good, politically and materially, spiritually speaking, they were, they were just lost. And, and it's in times like that that the Lord allows nations to, to go and they, He gives them enough rope <laughs> and then He just pulls on it. And so all of that, what we're starting to see, what we're going to see here from especially Jeroboam, who won it, even though he was good in so many of these other areas, this guy was evil. He was just evil. And so, so again, the, 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 the examples that, that, that we see in the northern kingdom with these other kings that lived, these six kings that followed Jeroboam during that time of Hosea's ministry, all of them, they were just doing the things that were evil. Of the six, four of them were violently overthrown. And one died as a conquered, exiled king in Assyria. So even though they were prospering in some areas, they were being punished in other areas when their kings were just being assassinated and just violently killed. Hosea began his ministry at a time when, when things looked so politically successful and economically prosperous and the people just didn't care about their God. And you're going to hear that in a little while when God, God brings a judgment upon them because they weren't even looking towards God. Everything became more important than God. Again, the seeds of idolatry Spiritual failure, moral corruption were sown in the days of Jeroboam. And it, and it ended up producing <laughs> a horrible, horrible harvest. Again, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And so this is what follows in the years of Jeroboam. Jeroboam, the first... <laughs> the first king after the division of Israel, he had led a popular re revolt against high taxations from, from Re Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, back in 1 Kings chapter 12. And Jeroboam II followed in his wicked footsteps. And, and maybe that's why, again, he, his name correlates with the first one him being number two he was just wicked and so in verse two to verse nine it says when the lord began to speak by <clears throat> hosea the lord said to hosea go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu. And bring an end to the house, or for the uh, bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Verse six, and she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, Call her name Lo Ruhama. 
for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by the bow, and will not save them by the bow, nor the sword or battle by horse or horsemen. Verse 8. And when she had weaned Lo Rahama, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, Call his name Lo Ami, for I, for, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Man, that's kind of sad. So when the Lord began to speak to this prophet Hosea, it's interesting because the first words to Hosea was something for his own life. I'm 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 calling you to be a prophet, and you're going to speak to the nation. You're going to speak to the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom will be ministered to by you as well. But before any of this happens, it has to become personal to you, Hosea. And so he speaks to him about his own life. And and most often than not, whenever the Lord really wants to do a work in in our lives, he often begins with us. (laughs) And I can't tell you how many times... The Lord has given me, or as I'm studying, and I'm, I, it's like, man, I can't wait to give this message to the people. And God says, hey, Zeke, take it to yourself first before you can give it out, and it will come out with passion <laughs> because I'm dealing with you. And I think oftentimes when, when we think of all these other people that, man, I just want to say this, I just want to do that, God says, hey, wait a minute, before you say anything, let me work with you. Let me, let me speak to your heart first so I can deal with your heart because your heart is wicked. <laughs> and I think oftentimes it's like we want to take the speck out of somebody's eye and we have a big old telephone pole sticking out of our own. And so oftentimes the word of the Lord speaks to us personally before it goes out to anybody else. And this is what happens in Hosea's life. Hosea probably would have preferred as he heard this message, that it was for someone else, not for him. (laughs) Go tell so-and-so to go do these things. But he calls him and he says, hey, let's go, we're going to make it personal and I'm going to give, I'm going to use you as a picture (laughs) for the nation of Israel and everything that's going on there. And you're going, no, Lord, why, why do I have to be the one that has to deal with this? And so before he could speak to the nation, he first has to hear from the Lord for himself. And he tells them this, take, go, take yourself a wife of harlotry. You almost have to go like, wait a minute, did I hear that right? It's not like, hey, go, go have fun with some harlots. It's like, no, take a wife. Of harlotry. The word of the Lord for him wasn't an easy word. It, it, again, you can, you, you can, if your son or, or somebody you knew say, hey man, the Lord, the Lord really wants me to get married. Oh, great. But he wants me to go down to like wherever harlots hang out. Um, <laughs> prostitute thing. And I have to go find a prostitute and marry her, we would talk him out of it in a heartbeat, going, you don't want to do that, mijo. I don't think that's the Lord. No, really, I heard from God that he wants me to go take a prostitute as my wife. And so, again, you could imagine when he's going, okay, Lord, I'm going to go back in prayer to make sure that I heard you correctly. He's told to take A prostitute. Why? And and he says right here at the end, or in the middle of the verse, he says, For the land, the land has committed great harlotry and departed from the Lord. The, The land here is the nation of Israel. 
And in this case, it's the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom, again, because of their kings, they had, they had gone after so many strange gods. They had committed spiritual fornication, spiritual immorality continuously. He says, I, I need you to go do this because you're going to represent the nation of Israel who has committed great harlotry. And they have departed from me. Though, though, though this command to, to Hosea, through it, God brings to life this consistent pattern of the nation of Israel. And he gives them this picture that throughout the Old Testament that, that, we, that we look at, again, the picture is that God was the husband of Israel. And so we see that picture, but we always see Israel going and doing whatever Israel wants to go do. Even though he says, but I married you. I made a commitment to you. I made, I made this covenant with you when I took you out of the land of Egypt. When I took you up to Mount Sinai, I made this pact with you. And, and he kept on warning them time and time again, what's out there, you don't want to be a part of that. So this is why I have to protect you. And you don't want to be like the other nations. And they're going, well, what are the other nations like? Well, I don't want to tell you because then you're going to want to be like them. But they already knew what the other nations were like. And God wanted them to be separate, wanted, to be, wanted them to be holy and consecrated. And yet they're going, but I want to go out there. And they had this thing in their mind that, that, again, it's like it must be greener on the other side. It must be better because everybody's doing it. And God's going, but you're not everybody. You're my wife. And I think oftentimes, again, in the things that we battle with because we, we come out of the world, that sometimes we linger at the world. We want to kind of go back. And God's going, but I've brought you to myself. Again, we're, we are now the bride of Christ. We're the bride, and yet we're going, well, before we get married, can I go have my fun, my bachelor party, or bachelorette party, whatever it is called. And so we battle just like these guys, because we look at, at these pictures, and we're going, why in the world would God do these kinds of things and give us these kinds of pictures? Like, because, guys, we do the same thing. Their passion and, 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 and chronic attraction towards the idols and the lust of an idolater is like the, adul the, the lust of an idolater or, or adulterer or adulteress. In other words, the people of Israel were just as unfaithful as a prostitute would be. And so here we have this vivid and graphic and powerful picture. And we see how idolatry <laughs> will lead to the rejection of your of your spouse of your uh, of god here in this picture and it almost kind of gives us this picture of how god would feel if god did feel now again i i don't god god doesn't feel like we feel but i'm sure there's sadness and there's heartbrokenness, but it's not like he sits around and pouts because of what's happened. He, he, he's above all that. But when we put things in front of the Lord, when, when, when we put someone else on the throne, I can imagine it hurts his heart, however that works. Because you've taken him off the throne and put whatever it is. And guys, sometimes it's things that we really love and that we should love. But we love them too much or we put them in front of God. And it goes down to as basic as our family, our spouse, our kids. All of those things that, that they take the throne and God's going, then, I, then, then you must not love me. <laughs> now again, I, I don't think God sits around and pouts like we might pout. He is a jealous God, but it's a righteous jealousy. And so whenever we put something in front of our God, it's like us being unfaithful. And how, how the, the, the person who, who has been cheated on would be hurt. And so the command to Hosea is, go take a wife. Of harlotry. 
God will, will put Hosea in a place where, where he will feel somewhat what God feels. And it doesn't feel good. Again, we, we cannot say that God grieves exactly the way we grieve. If only because he, he, he kind of controls all the things and, 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 and he always works out things according to his good pleasure. But nevertheless, there is this, this picture, this parallel between God's feelings and our feelings. And it's interesting because many of the commentators that I was reading, they, they press the issue or the idea that Gomer was not really a prostitute per se when Hosea first met her and married her. That she only became a prostitute afterwards. And Hosea knew from the Lord that that would happen. And, and, and again, we, we, the text... And I don't know, I, I know sometimes people read into the text because they're going, God would never tell somebody to go do that. But he has told some of his prophets to do crazier stuff. And so from the text, it sounds very plain to me. And I read other, other commentaries, and it's like, well, I guess. I guess it could, it could be that it's just symbolic that she was a prostitute or that she was never really, but it just kind of, you know, all these things. It's like, I don't know. I read it, and, and it seems pretty simple. Hey, go take a prostitute. Go, get, go, go, go to a woman who, who is in that field and bring her in. Because I guess people will assume that God would never allow one of his prophets to do that. And so the way I read it is plain and simple to me. And you can read it a different way, but it's plain and simple. And so it shows me, <coughs> it shows me that there was a lot of obedience <laughs> on the part of Hosea here. To actually carry out this difficult command. And I think when God commands us to do something that's difficult, we often turn back, and again, I've done it just like probably you've done it. That can't be what I heard, Lord. That, that, you want me to, to do the things that are easy, don't you? You want my life to be easy. And he's going, no, life is not easy. Life is sometimes hard. And what I'm asking you to do is the best thing because of what I have in store. And so he's asking them to go do something. And so it takes a lot of strength as I look at this for him to go and do what God has called them to go do. And when Hosea marries Gomer here, it doesn't seem like she gives up the career of prostitution. Now again, it just seems, again, he's calling her a wife of harlotry. Not one that maybe he went and took out of there and she fell in love with him and she never was a prostitute again. We're going to see that she's going to leave. It's, it's not a story of, of this like movie that you would watch that he brings her in and, he, and she falls in love with him. She never goes back. No, she kind of stays in that profession and kind of stays in that realm. And yet, here, it tells us in verse 4, where am I at? 4, somewhere around there, that she conceives, or verse 3, that she conceives and bores him a son, and bore him a son. And so now, this happy couple are man and wife. <laughs> and within a year or so, she conceives and bores, bears him a son. And then Jesus, or, or, or the Lord tells him, I need you to call this guy Jezreel. Now that doesn't sound bad, that his name would be Jezreel. And the, 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 the name spoke of two things here. First, Jezreel means scattered. 
and Israel would soon be scattered into exile by the conquering of the Assyrian army that would come. And secondly, Jezreel refers to the valley of Jezreel. And in the valley of Jezreel, we ran into a, na a name here by, in, in verse 4 by the name of Jehu. And Jehu was one of the kings. He was the great-grandfather. No, let me see. Yeah, Jehu, the great-grandfather and the founder of the dynasty of Jeroboam II. And so Jehu, he had lived one, two, three generations before Jeroboam II. And Jehu was the one that would go and massacre the descendants of King Ahab. And he had every right to go and massacre King Ahab, or, or at least murder or kill King Ahab, but he took it even further. And not only killed his, his, his family, but he had killed his wife Jezebel, and that was prophesied that he would kill Jezebel, or that Jezebel would die, and the way all of that was going to happen. But in 2 Kings chapter 10, it talks about what was supposed to happen there as he established the throne. And so God directs Hosea to name himself, his son Jezreel to confirm his promise that the bloodshed of Jezreel or in Jezreel would, would be the judgment of the house of Jehu. And so obviously God was not God was not, uh, it was not good news for, for, Je uh, for Jeroboam's dynasty because Jehu would end up killing that dynasty off. It would come to an end. Or it would, it would bring about a, a death to that. And so after the death of Jeroboam II in 752, his son Zechariah barely reigned for like six months before he was ass assassinated. And it would be at that time that the, the, the end of the house of Jehu would, cut, would, would be done, done away with. And it would bring an end to the kingdom of the house of, of Israel eventually. Just like, like the house of Jehu had fallen, so would the northern kingdom fall as well. And so he names him Jezreel because the judgment that was going to come upon the house of Jehu. But the, also, he says, and bring an end, at the end of verse 4, bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it says that he would, he would basically destroy them, defeat them, and they would be taken captive at the end of all of this. And he would break the bow of Israel, the bow being a symbol of power in the day, that, that that was their main instrument, instrument. and when, when it was bo broken, it symbolized the loss of power. And so in verse 6, when the next kid is, is born, the daughter, her name is Lo uh, Bahara, Baharam. No, Lo Ruhama, Ruhama, however it's pronounced. The name Lo Ruhama means no mercy. And so after about a year or so, she has another kid, and this time a daughter. They call her No Mercy. And can you imagine, every time they called her, everybody understood, No Mercy. This poor little girl to go through life being reminded of the judgment and the exile that was coming. Yet I will have mercy, he says, on the house of Judah, the southern kingdom. I will have mercy on them and will save them by their Lord. The Assyrian army, it's interesting, when they destroyed Israel, the northern kingdom, they also attacked the southern kingdom, but they weren't able to conquer them at all. Instead, God miraculously fought on behalf of of Judah, the southern kingdom, against Assyria. And in one night, 
the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 soldiers that were camped out in 2 Kings chapter 19. And it says this in 2 Kings 19, 35 and 36. It says, And it came to pass on the certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went his way, returned home and remained at Nineveh. And so the fact that God had no mercy for the northern kingdom, Israel, and yet had mercy towards Judah, the southern kingdom. And it shows us a couple of things here. First, that it's true that Judah and her kings were more faithful because there was more kings on the southern kingdom that it said, and they did right in the sight of the Lord. And it kind of shows us about even King Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18, where he, when he came in, he destroyed everything, all the high places. He got rid of everything and everybody started worshiping again. And so again, there were those times, the northern kingdom never had those times that they had like that, but Hezekiah brought that in. And secondly, it doesn't really matter if Judah was more worthy of mercy or not than Israel because by the very nature, by, by mercy's very nature, mercy is mercy. And I, I wrote this down. It says, if, if one deserves leniency, then leniency is a matter of justice, not mercy. Mercy is only shown to the guilty. And so even though the, the southern kingdom is still guilty, they were shown mercy. They weren't shown leniency. They were shown mercy because they were guilty. It is within the wise and loving heart of God to show mercy to whom he will show mercy. I found this quote. It says, but one is never unfair for not showing mercy. Being fair is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. I thought that was fascinating. Mercy on its own is mercy and is only given to, to the guilty. And so in verses 9 and 8 and 9, again, another year or so has passed. And when... She had wing, wing lo, ruhama. She conceived and bore a son. Then God said, call his name lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. So, so after a time, Gomer bears another son. And you would think that his name would get better. But his name, his name means not my people. And again, every time they called Lo Ami, they were saying, you're not my people. It's unfortunate, man. This poor kid has to live with that. But it's interesting because at that time, the people were pushing away the Lord their God. And they no, no longer were considered to be his people in that sense. Now, what's interesting is, since Gomer had not given up her prostitution, there may be a cruel irony here in the name Loami. Is it possible? Could it be? Is there any possibility that this son was not the son of Hosea? and yet another man's son. And maybe his appearance made it so obvious. You're not my son. You're not my people. And yet the message God had delivered to Israel through Hosea, and even though it was hard, God had Hosea live it out first. You are not my people. And I will not be your God. 
as much as that sounds as a, like a sentence or, or a penalty, it is stating a simple fact that the people really didn't want God to be their God. They were fighting against Him. They were doing everything they could possibly do against Him. And so when He says, you're not my people... It's almost like the people that, that, that are raised in the Christian community and they come a point going, I don't want to serve your God. And they go do their crazy stuff and then when something bad happens, it's like, why is God doing this to me? It's like, well, you didn't want God in the first place. So why, why are you getting upset at God? And, and, and I find that fascinating because they want to go do their own thing and God lets them go do their own thing and they're saying, well, I'm, I'm not even a Christian, blah, blah, blah. And then when something bad happens, it's like, why would God allow that? And yet that's where these people are. The people had rejected their God, and here the God, God simply recognizes that fact because he doesn't play, hey, let's pretend. Pretend that you are my people, and I will pretend that I am your God. He says, no, the game's over. And so in verse 10, we'll read 10, 11, and verse 1 of chapter 2. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it is said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said, to them, you are sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall gather, shall be gathered together, and appointed for the, and appoint for themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land. For great will be the day of Jezreel. Verse one of chapter two. Say to my brethren, my people, and to your sister, mercy is shown. Though, though, though God had promised judgment, the days of judgment wouldn't last forever. After judgment, there would come a day of prosperity, of, a day of increase, and a day of blessing. Where it says, you are not my people. It shall be said of them, you are sons of the living God. So God would fulfill the promise of lo ami, but the judgment would not last forever. And this is what, again, we see the mercy of God. We see his redemptive love towards his people that even though they have to go away, and, and the northern kingdom would eventually be caught up in, 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 in with the people, and they would eventually become the, the Samaritans. The, most of the people from the, the northern kingdom doing all that they did, they would come back to that place in the northern part of Jerusalem or, or Israel and be known as the Samaritans, half-breeds. And so, so once again... God calls them sons of the living God. When the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, in verse 11, God promised a restoration so complete that the, divide, the, the division that ca caused by that civil war that, that, that Rehoboam and Jeroboam the first, when they had divided, it had been about 170 years earlier. And one day that would all be erased and they would come back to be a people again. But it wouldn't happen until after their captivity and they would all come back eventually that we covered back in our other studies last year. For great will be the day of Jezreel the first child of Hosea and Gomer was named Jezreel. As a sign of judgment, God had promised a restoration 
that it would be so complete that Jezreel will once again have a name of greatness. Because even though the name Jezreel means God scatters, it also means God, God sows. He plants. And so once again, it would be a great place. Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sister, mercy is shown. And so what we see here is the completion of this restoration that was taking place. A child named Jezreel has his name redeemed, and the next two children, Lo Raham, Rahama, no mercy, and Lo Ami, not my people, have their names redeemed so that Israel will once again be regarded as my people and he will show mercy upon them. And so what we see here is, is this almost like judgment but redemption, judgment, redemption, and he uses the children of Hosea. And again, so we see this, this crazy story of how it starts out. And we will see judgment and redemption continually. And guys, whenever there is a judgment, it is so righteous on the, on the part of God when he brings judgment. But his heart, as much as he's not afraid to bring judgment, his heart is always redemption. Even in our own lives, guys. Because again, we have been obedient, we have been disobedient. And, and, and again, when you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, and it says, if you're obedient, all these blessings. If you're not obedient, all these curses. And God stays true to his word. And even though he brings judgment, it doesn't always last forever. Not in the sight of God. Unless we totally walk away and we never come back to him. But he always woos us back. He has something within him that you are that special, that I am that special. That he will let you do, go do what you want to go do, but you're going to miss out on the blessings that he has for you. And so I think oftentimes the judgment that we have, again, there's consequences that we, can, we, can have, we, we might have to um, take care of, but oftentimes he allows us to go like the prodigal and go live a decadent life if we want to. But God never forgets that, they, they, that you are still his child. And, and he kind of looks for you to come to your right mind and he brings you back and he woos you back. And then he blesses you above measure. But all that time the son was missing out on the blessings of his father. And that's what happens to us. That's what we see with Israel. Every time they went away, they missed out on God's blessing. And when they, they were chastised, he would bring them back and he would love them once again. And we're going to see that in, in Hosea, how he does that with his wife. <laughs> that even though she goes away from him, he's never going to forget about her until God says, go bring her back, go buy her back. And so we have a beautiful picture of redemption here and so whenever we see judgment there will always be an evidence of redemption right around the corner amen father thank you so much for your word lord oh father thank you so much for showing us your your mercy lord and even though lord god we have to go through times in our lives sometimes of being chastised because of our disobedience lord because of our own desires because of the things that, that just grip us at times, Lord God, I pray that, Lord, we would be reminded that we are missing out on the blessings when we walk away, when we desire our own thing, Lord. I pray, God, for humility on our part, Lord, that, Lord, when we sin, Lord, that we would truly, Lord, turn back to you quickly, Lord, because you want that fellowship with us and that we would desire to have that closeness with you. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for this book. I pray that I might be able to do it justice as we study through it, Lord, and that we would be reminded through it, Lord, as we see judgment, but we also will see redemption, Lord God, that, that that's the way you work, Father. And Lord, I just thank you and praise you for our time tonight, Lord. We continue to pray for our church, Lord. Continue to pray for our community here, Lord. Continue to pray for our our county, our state, our, 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 our nation, Lord, with all the unrest, Lord, 
This is not the first time in history, Lord, that craziness happens. And so, Lord, as we cry out, Lord, Lord, we, we want to be able, Lord God, to, to pray. And, Lord, you would bring the judgment that's needed. But bring the redemption, Lord, because I know that you're able to do that in our lives, in the lives of our, our brothers and sisters, and in the life of this, this country. And so we pray, God, that you would have full control of everything that's going on. We look to you and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing this last song. Bless you guys. <clears throat>